another interview right here with Fame Live Magazine. This is your girl, Cherry Garden, and today we have the honor of interviewing a gentleman that's really making some moves right here in Atlanta and is starting to take it across the nation. He's in the film industry and he's really doing his thing. None other than the CEO of Clairvoyant Films, Gideon P. Sarah. How are you doing today, darling? Thank you. All right, all right. Good, good. Okay, so you're a pretty mysterious guy. You know, you're over here with your shoes, you got this hat on. Yeah, mysterious. <laughs> what? Tell us a little bit about you. Where did it all begin? Where did you come into this world? Mm, came into this world, Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. Said, pack it up, let's go to Alabama. And they said, pack it up, let's go to Chicago. So. Okay, okay. So let's say in, I guess, your preteen years or so, is that when you kind of started developing an interest in film or art? Or what was the journey like for you in, in this industry? Or in this talent, I should say? Well, um, I say that all my talents, all my gifts come from the Mashiach, Yahoo Shua. You know, the black revolutionary messiah. Everything that I am comes from the creator. Yahuwah Elohim, Yahuwah Nisi that propels everything I do and everything my bloodline does, everything my family does. So we come from a, a, a family of artists. A family of artists who made jewelry, who made, um, you know, sculptures, paintings, all of that. So definitely movies was something I wanted to do, but it was definitely last on the totem pole. It was not ever something I wasn't going to make a career, you know. Okay, okay. So when you, what, what were you doing in the teenage years to start expressing your art? What were some of the first art forms that you got in this? Getting into shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first art form, studying how to get into some shit. I'm, I'm being dead serious. Yeah. Get, getting, into, getting into trouble, man. I mean, I would, I would draw, you know, draw comic books and that sort of thing. Um, we drew comic books and that was probably one of my first little businesses. We drew comic books and sold them in school. Um, at the price that they sold comic books in the stores, you know, two ninety five, and people was coming out the pocket with the lunch money buying it, you know. But for the most part, um, I was just bored, just bored. So I would end up going into the wrong kind of direction, you know. Okay. Um, because you can be creatively criminalistic. You can be creatively, you know, revolutionary. You can be creatively a lot of things, you know. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Well, what was the name of your comic book? Um, he had a bunch of them. One was called Tora, T A U R A. One was called, um, this has been so long ago. <laughs> it's been a minute. Uh, I can't exactly remember um, some of the names, but he had a lot of different names. It was just just kind of reinventions of like the image comics, you know, mm -hmm. the Cyber Force and Spawn and, and all of them, you know. They was like the dark side of uh, Marvel Comics image. But you say Torah, which is a little bit more, like, sounds more Egyptian, huh? Torah, it was kind of, actually it was Japanese, it was oh. Japanese, um, kind of like an anime okay. kind of cartoon. Um, and we just drew it up in a comic book. She had this burnt up, scarred up face or whatever like that, but she was like a, a heroine or a superhero, you know, super, super shiro. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we just kind of just built up that concept, but we were really just trying to find ourselves as far as artistically. Right, right. Yeah, so, okay, so you started off drawing and sketching and doing this comic book. Um, did you ever, in your young years, acquire a camera and start shooting, or how did it kind of transition artistically down the path that you I have, I never had no intentions of being a director. None, none, none whatsoever. Um, so, I mean, my whole, my whole thing was Earlier we was drawing comic books and then after that we was doing rap, hip hop. Oh. Like, I mean, seriously. So, rapping, okay. Tell me a little bit about that. Were, what artists inspired you in that realm? Well, we, we had a group called Vendetta Underworld of the South. And we was doing shows out here in Atlanta anyway. You know, but um, like Outkast, um, we was cut from the Wu-Tang Club, mm -hmm. Big L, all those people who inspired the people who inspired the people out there, you know. Yeah. So we was cut from their club, cut from their level. Like when Ludacris and all them dudes was rhyming and everything like that, we was matching our styles and parting our styles up against their style, you know. So I mean, it was it's totally, it was a totally, still is a, a serious undertaking, you know, like an out rapper or a flash rapper. Ah, 
any of them. I'm sanctified, yeah, but my whole hood shooters. My bloodline run true with the tribe of Judah. Pronounce Yehuda, king slick like Rick the ruler. Nobody made it where I'm from, they wanna see us do it. I'm from the gutter where the angels got to see you through it. I'm a gospel rapper, how I'm more gangster than the gangster rappers. Y'all switch around like you got raped and then spanked after us. I kill a track and it be shaking and then stanking after us. Misunderstood like I've been you, you, speaking backwards. We gave you a chance, go on advance. Cause if you rhyme on the same track, your favorite rapper might as well backup dance. You gonna write your rhyme, sound like it on the air bar. Everybody Hates Chris and everybody hates ya. Get it? With dark shades on, a cool committee. I'm abstinent, but old girl, she got some groovy titties. Nah, I ain't touch. Okay, I looked, but everything a nigga do it for the people of the book, shawty. Good EMP man, call me the preacher man. Bruh, bruh, hustling backwards, let me teach that man. We on that damn dash tip, we ain't asking. Pay me what you owe, or buy me a freaking casket. Cause anywhere it go, you crack us and spending cash with me. I was, I was built for a different generation. Y'all let fellas with pantyhose and dress up and makeup on their faces. They not even write their rhymes for more, so yeah, I can still outdo it. You said that you were doing shows in Atlanta. Does that mean you were living somewhere else at the time? Is this in high school? No, this was 22, 23, 24, 25. Oh. He, was, he was doing um, my shows at different spots on Armour Avenue, just, just throughout the different spots in the underground Atlanta area. And what was your rapper name? Oh, same name, I got it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Did your rap have a a particular like direction or theme that kind of you can see it developed into the message of where you are today or what your company does today? But well, it's, it's definitely similar. Um, it was more on the wave than we always got compared to Outkast. You know, um, the guy y'all know as Rio Sarah now, we were in a group together, so he would always get compared to Andre 3000. I would always get compared to Big Boy, but I never wanted to be in nobody's box, you know, period. So, some way, I mean, that same current, that same wave lift that Outkast had, it's the same wave lift our music was on, you know? Um, just basically rebellion. Rebellion, that was the whole tone of it. Rebellion against what? Rebellion against, that was the funny part. <laughs> rebellion for the sake of rebellion. Rebellion for the sake of rebellion. You sake know? Of rebellion. So, okay. I grew a whole lot after that and I found out rebellion <laughs> has to be constructive. It has to be constructive. You can't be rebellion just because you want to start some shit, you know. <laughs> You're rebel with a cause, right, right? Right, Gotta have a cause, gotta have a point to it, you know. So are you saying that in those days, you didn't really have a cause per se. Did you find that your cause kind of developed over a period of time or did something happen that inspired you to, to give you a level of direction? I think the cause I have now is more grounded than ever. And, um, I guess, I guess it's the lesson that most humanity is dealing with right now, and that's really obedience. <laughs> obedience, obedience. A lot of times people think their own way is the best way, you know? And sometimes you gotta live long enough or you gotta be wise enough to know that the most high is the best way, I mean, way is the only way, you know? The only way. If he, if he got infinite knowledge, if he got infinite wisdom, how do you know every which way that thing's gonna turn? Every situation, where your situation gonna turn? So, you can't see, but only so high, but only so far, only so deep, you know? So, um, that's the name of the game now. The cause is so much more, so much more different. So much more different. The current is still the same, but it's definitely rebellion with the cause now. Wow. I've erected fire. So it's kind of like you went from rebellion to obedience, in a way. Right, which right. is like a complete contrast. Yeah. But it, it shows you a little bit some about the polarity of life because there can be a level of resurrection, I mean, uh, insurrection, a level of revolution, even in obedience. Even in obedience. You see, everybody got to answer to somebody. Everybody got to follow somebody. The chain of command, the cause and effect, you know? So um, when you know who you follow and you know whose rules you follow, sometimes their rules aren't acceptable to the masses. If you understand what I'm saying, the Mashiach, the Most High, the Messiah, um, follow all the rules of the Most High, all the rules of his father. He obeyed, obeyed the law to the letter, but he was a rebel during his time and paid the ultimate price for it called crucifixion. So it's just like uh, same thing with Malcolm, same thing with Malcolm, Martin Luther King, perfect example. He was following the rules of justice, the laws of justice, but in his time he was a lawbreaker. He paid the price by going to jail. He went to jail a lot of times and he never punched nobody in the face. Now one time, but he went to jail a bunch of times and was such seen as a lawbreaker, a criminal. He got a bug shot. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So he broke laws. He rebelled. But he was following the rules of justice. So you can be obedient and still be a rebel at the same time. It's the weird contradiction of existence. Now, these figures that you're speaking about right now, they were more so based in the 60s, and you're talking more about like what you were going through in your 20s. Were there any other people that influenced how you developed your cause as well, like in books you were reading? Yeah, uh, several books, several books. Um, the Auto War, um, you know, just several, several different books. I can think about more people who inspire me than kind of like the books, and okay. unfortunately, <laughs> but fortunately, most of them are not here no more. They did. Like Jim Morrison and doggone, um, just historical figures. Mm -hmm. Like they have nothing to do with filming whatsoever. Historical figures. People like uh, Shaka Zulu. People like um, um, M. Hotel. Um, Mansa Musa. You know, just historical figures. Frank Matthews. <laughs> he was the only dude so dope and got away with it. Period. Period. If y'all was too bad at it. You know, so it's just like certain people's intellect, how they overcame what they did or conquered nations, you know. And we're a nation inside of a nation, so that don't mean the nation builders died out just because you're an American citizen. I don't mean you don't have the ambition of somebody like an Alexander the Greek <laughs> to conquer a nation. Why they, why, you know, why certain nation conquering got to be really regulated to a certain demographic? Yeah. So do you feel like there's a nation that needs to be conquered here in the U.S.? Or what are your views on that? I feel like it's more so mind frames and ways of life and certain perspectives that need to be not only conquered but overcome. Because mm -hmm. we got a lot to do, not only as a black nation, but as just a humanity. We got a whole lot to do. And it's going to require <laughs> some changing of perspectives, you know? And it's going to feel like conquering a nation going to feel like conquering a country, you know, because to be perfectly honest, it's like, uh, shoot, the, the world we live in is the world we think about. You know, two or three or four people can look at one different object and go have 20,000 different opinions because of their beliefs and experiences and how they were raised and how they grew up, you know. So that's my perspective when I'm talking about nation building, when I'm talking about being an empire creator. Conquering ideas, creating ideas. So I'm going to share something which is very interesting. Like, people kind of don't think about this. Everything, we could use this room as an example. All of this was in somebody's head. The pants you got on, the shirt you got on, the necklace I got on. Everything was once in somebody's head as an image. Mm -hmm. Then they drew it out, then somebody put the material together and made it. So we were wearing somebody's idea. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, that's my whole perspective is just creating ideas. Finish, that's finished creation. That's finished creation. We, we own somebody's street right now that's named after somebody else. Yes. You know, Whale well Street. That's somebody else's last name. That, that's, this is their street, you know? So they're still creating, creating. Buildings being knocked down, new buildings being created. You know, so I'm looking at myself as a co creator. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for keeping it locked right here on Fame Live Magazine. Of course, this is your girl, Cherry Garden, and we are here with producer, director, Gideon P. Sarah. All right, so we were, we were talking about Yoni, and we were talking about Black Pulp. And um, how, long, how long ago did you make Yoni? Yoni, uh, we started making that in 2014, so, and, you know, premiered it and got it out to the public in 2015. Wow, that was a good turnaround time. Okay, and so where can our viewers see the movie? Right, they can see Yodi on um, filmplug.net, it's on Amazon. Um, we send it up on iTunes and we're about to get it on um, Netflix very soon. But it's a short, man, it's like about 38 minutes, you know, 35, 38 minutes. Okay, okay, okay. So what would intrigue me to want to watch Yodi? It does say on your shirt, your dream is everything. Mm -hmm. And then it has Yodi in like red, almost looking like blood splatter. So, hmm, what can I expect when I watch Yodi? Hmm, there's a scene where a dude get choked with a noose. <laughs> okay. White cat. That makes it even more fun. That's what it feels like. 
got another scene where a girl get a leg broke with a crowbar. <laughs> 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 I'm just, you know, if you like action packed stuff, stuff that you're not gonna expect to happen, yeah. that's why you wanna watch it. But for the most part, it's like black folk. I mean, it's zany. I just, it's gonna be zany, the most crazy stories you're gonna tell. But it's not reckless foolishness for the sake of foolishness, you know. It ends on a high note. Um, it's a little bit more obvious in Yodi. It's less obvious in white folks. You know, um, you know, you got to get a little pads. You know, on your first movie, you gonna make, you know, you gonna learn. You know, so your second film, let's take a, I don't know, Spike Lee. She's gotta have it. You know, compare that with Do the Right Thing. Those are like two different films. You know, so grew a lot from you. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the getting into film come first, or did Black Hulk come first? But well, definitely, uh, get into film. Get into film came first, and Every other idea that came after that, um, just built on top of that, you know, um, that thirst or that desire to be in film, which was really just a spur of the moment kind of thing. It was totally unexpected, totally up here, you know. What happened? How did you get into the film? Um, I was at Montgomery, Alabama, and um, it just came in my head to write a story. It was a horror story. and. Um, I couldn't get nobody to finance it. I was gonna make it a play, but this woman kept giving me the run around. I ain't gonna name her name, Felicia. I ain't gonna name her name, but <laughs> I was getting the run around. She kept giving me the run around, so I was just like, I was in a tough situation. I was staying in some rundown hotels that was too gangster. I mean, the dog on new kids was out there playing with tires, and they're not gonna go blue, blue, blue. Hey, can I take out your trash for some money? I mean, shoot, like everybody out there was leaving hard. So I'm sitting in there in the hotel, looking up in the ceiling at one of my characters from Yogi. Roaches crawling the wall and all that. And I was like, yo, how do you get out of this situation? Now, is Black Pulp something that you think is, do you feel like that is your classic style? Or is that something any other director or film producer could jump into and pick up on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it would be just like somebody saying, well, I came up with romances and nobody else can do romances. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I came out with Black Pope and they free the, the trap, trap, they style of Black Pope, you know? Because, I mean, as soon as 30,000 people jump on her, I have two more other genres I'll create coming, you know? So um, I might do a gospel horror movie, you know? I keep switching it on and keep mixing it up together so I get tired. Oh. <laughs> So what exactly is the style of Gideon, Gideon Pissarra? Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Um, what I say is kind of slick, unduplicable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like making my own words up. But it's, it cannot be duplicated to a certain extent because it's me pouring my soul out. It's just like saying, what is the style of Marvin Gaye? Like you, everybody know Marvin Gaye's music when they hear it. They know it. And I ain't comparing myself to Marvin Gaye, I'm just making an example. Mm -hmm. You know, like, Everybody know if somebody like Robin Thicke is trying to copy his rips. Mm -hmm. You know, even when Sam Cooke, how Sam Cooke used to sing, everybody knew if Bobby Womack or somebody else was inspired by Sam Cooke. So. To meet her at the station, ain't that good news, man? Ain't that news? In the letter, she told me she still loved me. Ain't that good news, man? Ain't that news? It was just like that's me pouring my soul out. So in order to do a style like Gideon Peace of Rye, you're going to have to live in Jackson, Mississippi. You're going to have to live in Chicago. You're going to have to, you know what I'm saying, have fist fights in the house. You're going to have to be on welfare food stamps. You're going to have to bail your family out of jail. You're going to have to feel my experience. you have to be in church 24-7. You know what I'm saying? Bible class, then prayer. When you come out of Bible class, then <laughs> choir words, all that. Because that's me pouring my soul out. I'm just doing it in the medium of thing. So how did the clairvoyant films come about? Um, yeah, just just me came up as a way of me to be control of my own destiny, as far as my creative destiny. Um, you know, I just don't believe in waiting for somebody to put you on. That's the waggest thing on the planet. You know, put yourself on. It. So, um, like most of the ideas I ever came with, it came through as almost like a breath of air flowing through. The names, the ideas, everything would just come to my head, and I would feel it. I know if it clicked or not. You know. So, um, that's how Claire Boyne came to me. I'm going to tell you like this. Carol Hush once said something like this. You plan first, you put all your things together, and then you try to make sense out of your plans. Whereas, the spiritual meaning comes first. You don't know what this stuff means. The 
idea just hits you. And then over time, it starts to make perfect sense. Oh, and it becomes, makes so much perfect sense that it becomes almost uncanny. Like, as never in a million years that I kind of lined that up the way I lined it up. So, clairvoyant just means you see things before they happen. So, I got 40 scripts already laying out. You know what I'm saying? I got my movies and everything that I'm going to put out already laid out to the T. So, clairvoyant is just representing the new ideas I'm offering not only to the film industry, but to the art form period. You know, we used to have speakeasy, we used to have black and white films and silent films. You mean to tell me it ends like where's that now? This is the cap on movie making? Are you serious? No, clairvoyant says it's gonna go somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. So what's the difference or the distinction between clairvoyant pictures as well um, from outlaw, outlaw films? Well, Outlaw is more of a um, kind of a take on my approach to entertainment, to the industry, just period. You know, the Outlaw filmmakers, um, it's kind of like the tagline says, because I got to be, not because I want to be. You know, y'all want to be me. Y'all want to be somebody else. I'm doing this because I got to be. I got to do it. Somebody got to tell these stories. It's certain stories that got to be said, that got to be made. You know, certain times, certain people got to be born to tell those stories. And they build with the fire, they build with the personality that say it and put it out the way it needs to. So the outlaw is just my approach to the industry. You know? Tell my story, however I gotta tell it. I, I mean I don't believe in waiting for somebody to put you on. So that's what outlaw filmmakers is. I'm cut from the cloth of Gordon Parks. You know, I'm cut from the cloth of Melvin Van Peoples. They did not sit there and wait for somebody to give them a chance to make their films or put their product out. You know, so they put their head together, put their resources together, their creativity together, and put their project out the way they want to do it. And that's how you transcend. That's how you transcend. And kick open the doors so somebody else can bounce off your foundation and keep on kicking in doors over and over and over. Yeah. And nobody's feelings got to be hurt. You can still keep your jobs and all that. Doesn't mean kicking doors means somebody got to get fired. You know? <laughs> well, how can you be a rebel and still be obedient? Ah, that's where. Ah, yeah, be like, dude, don't come to America. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. So, Outlaw is more of the mindset. Clairvoyant is the company name. Yeah. Okay. And Clairvoyant produced this new movie called White Folks. Right. So, tell us a little bit about White Folks. What made you go from Yodi into White Folks? Once again, it was just an inspiration that came through me. And uh, we was riding around and the idea just hit me, just came to my head. You know what I'm saying? And it was just inspired by, you know what I'm saying, Iceberg Slim work that he put out. And um, I just thought it was me. I was like, cool, this would be a cold idea to put out. And so white folks would just be taking black folk to another side. You know, it's, it's, it's more perfected in this next film with white folks. You know? So, um, it still has the same dark edge to it, and with this, it's just really concentrating on, I say it like this, Outkast did it the best. When Outkast would drop an album, every album was different, and every album had its own vibe to it. They would never do another Southern playlist at Cadillac Music. They'll never do another Atlas. They'll never do another Stankonia, so that's how all my feelings is. It's only going to be one Yoda, that's it. Then after that, it's White Folks, and then after White Folks, I got another horror movie that I'm coming out with. So White Folks is just about... The whole lifestyle of players and cons and the right way, the way it was never represented for real in front of the TV cameras. You know, we ain't talking about the pimps with the, with the goofy hat and the bug teeth, that's from foolishness. We're talking about the real lifestyle that would really never die. <laughs> it, will, it was here almost, I almost want to say before the beginning of the world, but it would definitely be here for a long time after America's gone and everywhere else. Okay. It's there. Most pimps don't wear a brim. Most <laughs> pimps don't wear a brim. Most pimps don't wear a brim. Not okay. Wall Street. Better believe. Oh, Better believe. Oh, interesting concepts. Okay, okay. They well, wear I mean, Target. You know, Target and Kroger. Oh, I know. Best pimps on the planet. You see, they got all these people working for them every day. Every day. Missing family, missing friends. I gotta go to work to build up a dude who created Kroger. He's not working there. You're working there. <laughs> this is true. This is true. 
Wow. And when you get tired, they say it's cup and blow. So I got 30 more other people that I can put in your spot. Just if you, you get tired, I get tired of looking at you. I can fire you and put three more people in your spot. That's pimping. Pimping, pimping. Yeah, it ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Sounds like you're talking about the nine to five as a con. Ooh. <laughs> Who would think someone would do something? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I was just curious in asking that question because you mentioned that you have 40 other scripts, um, and I'm sure those are all swirling around in your mind, and I was wondering what made, you know, white folks zone in as, yeah, that's the one that I'm going to produce now. Was it like the climate? The racial climate, and because you know the name white folks, it sounds like it might be racially charged, is it? Actually, it's not. That was the funny part. I actually came up with the idea. I was riding around with Bobby Horton, who was starring in the film, and um, um, we was having a conversation, and he said something about, um, <laughs> for lack of better words, being a token white. I said, "Bro, ain't no such thing. <laughs> ain't no such thing." But I. Um, but the, as soon as he said that the idea came to my head, Trick Baby. And I said, you ever heard of this book called Trick Baby? You ever heard of Iceberg Slam? And he said, yeah. I said, what, what do you think, um, if somebody came up with a movie called White Force, what would you think that was about? And he said, a bunch of KKK, probably shooting up shit and all that other type of stuff. And I said, exactly. So you always want somebody to bring them in one direction, just to upset their expectation as far as what they may expect you would have done. And that's what I do usually sometimes with titles. I, I like the fact that you think, oh, he's from hip hop and he's from the hood and he's there in the third. I do a love story over behind. So elegant, so beautiful. So that's what I did with half the stuff I'm going to keep doing. But with white folks, it was a title that I knew people would look at and think it was racially charged, but it has nothing pretty much to do with racism. It has everything to do with two con artists who hustle the Russian mafia. And it's there, uh, the movie is showing pretty much the consequences of the con life through the different people they met, as they only got 14 days to bring back $2 million. Mm. And if you're doing a movie, you want a, you, you want a, you want a title of shot. You want a title at least memorable. White folks is basically damn sure memorable. Do, do you feel like it might scare away certain demographics from wanting to watch the movie? I do not care, because I'm an outlaw filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> I do not care. I do not care. <laughs> I do not care because I'm the outlaw filmmaker. I mean, I'm not here to make sure that I am patched up and real beautiful, beautiful with the nice pink bow on my neck so I can make you feel less cautious. And I mean, there are a lot of people who are good at doing it. <laughs> That's they way, you know. So my job is to be me. I don't want to be nobody else. So part of being me is definitely not worried about my shots. Because I feel like you, if you are authentically being you, you will shock some people. If you be yourself, that's the most shocking thing you can do, is be yourself. You have a point. You're shocking your mama, your parents, and everybody else. <laughs> I didn't know you thought like that. What's the progress with the movie White Folks? Is it going to be, there's an event, a premiere happening, I believe? Well, Steph, we got a, no, we're not going to premiere status so super hard, but we're going to do like a gala event. It's going to be uh, a player's ball theme, you know, so. We're going to have the whole book out there with the wicker chairs, the peacock human Newton chairs out there, all of that, you know. And uh, basically, it'll, it'll be a, a gala event, red carpet event, showing the movie White Folks to the public where they can come through and enjoy it. Like so many people have already and gave it the super thumbs up. Super thumbs up. You, I say, to, uh, you say so many people have already, there were a few screenings and things like that that have occurred so far. And how did those go? Oh, they went great. Great. We got 81 responses. You know, so I don't want to tell you that they compared it to Reservoir Dogs. I don't want to tell you they compared it to Pulp Fish. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna sit there and say that. <laughs> no, not at all. But uh, you know, we got we got a lot of love for for the film that we did, and that's all I ask for. Are you hoping that the movie White Folks will impact um, its audience in a certain kind of way? Oh, well, definitely impact. It's gonna absolutely impact. You know, um, it's got a few prophecies off of it. You know. It's got a lot of game. It's like I put, man, hour and forty, hour and forty minutes a game. Yeah. Hour and forty minutes a game. A lot of wisdom. So I should be charged like five hundred dollars to get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Because you'll watch it and you'll know not to work a nine to five no more. At least dial one. Have an ambition. Have a goal.
They tell yourself it's called a dead end job. You're going to die on it. Mm. Dead end. That's the end of you. <laughs> so disrupt some in plain sight. Yeah, in plain sight. I don't see the movie that's definitely going to impact you a whole lot. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Well, let us know. Is there anything that you would want us to look out for in the future from Clear Point Films? And of course, mention your social media so that our viewers can log on and follow. But I definitely would want to work with you again in the film. You did an amazing, amazing, amazing job. And um, that's one of the things I definitely want to look forward to working with in Clairvoyant. And uh, like I said, I got a whole gang of horror movies coming out next, like a whole like a little set of horror movies coming out next. So y'all keep a vibe for that. And you, you'll see me. I, I, I'll make sure to make my voice loud so everybody can hear when I got my things lined up for my next project. Everyone, pictures and entertainment, y'all check for that. Instagram, Facebook, and all of that. And we'll definitely keep y'all posted. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, director, producer, cinematographer, <laughs> Gideon P. Seurat. It has been a pleasure having you here on Fame Live Magazine. This was Gideon P. Seurat. And thank you. Make sure you keep it locked. Till next time.